Welcome back, you are on Miss Johnson's YouTube channel. Today I'm going to be doing a read aloud from the chapter book we're doing is A Series of Unfortunate Events, The Bad Beginning by Lemony Snicket. We are going to catch back up with the Baudelaire children and we are on chapter five. So let's get started. Chapter five. Unless you have been very, very lucky, you have undoubtedly experienced events in your life that have made you cry. So unless you have been very, very lucky, you know what a good long session of weeping can often make you feel, even if your circumstances have not changed one bit. So it was with the Baudelaire orphans. Having cried all night, they rose the next morning feeling as if the weight, as if a weight were lifted off their shoulders. The three children knew, of course, that they were still in a terrible situation, but they thought they might do something to make it better. The morning's note from Count Olaf ordered them to chop firewood in the backyard, and as Violet and Klaus swung the axe down on each log to break it into smaller pieces, they discussed possible plans of action. While Sunny chewed in, uh, meditatively on a small piece of wood, Clearly, Klaus said, fingering the ugly bruise on his face where Olaf had struck him, we cannot stay here any longer. I would rather take my chances in the streets and live in this terrible place. But who knows what misfortunes would befall on us in the streets, Violet pointed out. At least here we have a roof over our heads. I wish our parents' money could be used now instead of when we you come of age, Klaus said. Then we could buy a castle and live in it, with armed guards patrolling the outside to keep out Count Olaf and his troop. And I could have a large inventing studio, Violet said wistfully. She swung the axe down and, a split, and split a log nearly in two, filled with gears and pulleys and wires and an elaborate computer system. And I could have a used, huge library, Klaus said, as comfortable as Justice Strauss's, but more enormous. Gibbo, Sunny shrieked, with, which appeared to mean, and I could have lots of things to bite. But in the meantime, Klaus, Violet said, we have to do something about our predicament. Perhaps Justice Strauss could adopt us, Klaus said. She said we always were always welcome in her home. But she meant for a visit, or to use her library, Violet pointed out. She didn't mean to live. Perhaps if we explained the situation to her, she would agree to adopt us, Klaus said hopefully. But when Violet looked at him, at him, she saw that he knew it was of no use. The adoption is an enormous decision and not likely to happen impulsively. I'm sure you and your life have occasionally wished... Wish to be raised by different people than the ones you're, who are raising you. But in your heart, that the chances of this were happening were very slim. I think we should go see Mr. Poe, Violet said. He told us when he dropped us off that he, we could contact him at the bank if there were any questions. We don't really have any questions, Klaus said. We have a complaint. He was thinking of Mr. Poe walking toward them in a briny beach with his terrible message. Even though the fire was, of course, not Mr. Poe's fault, Klaus was reluctant to see Mr. Poe because he was afraid of getting more bad news. I can't think of anyone else to contact, Violet said. Mr. Poe is in charge of our affairs, but I'm sure if he knew how horrid Count Olaf is, he would take us right out of here. Klaus pictured Mr. Poe arriving in his car and putting the Baudelaire orphans inside to go somewhere else and, with a, and felt a stirring of hope. Anywhere would be better than here. Okay, he said, let's go the firewood all chopped and then we can go to the bank. Invigorated with their new plan, the Baudelaire orphans swung their axes at an amazing speed, and soon enough they were done chopping firewood and ready to go to the bank. They remembered Count Olaf saying they had a map of the city, and they looked thoroughly for it, but they couldn't find any trace of a map, and decided it must be in the tower where they were forbidden to go. So without directions of any sort, the Baudelaire children set off for the city's banking districts in hoping and finding Mr. Poe. After walking through the meat district, the flower district, and the sculpture district, the three children arrived at the baking district, pausing to take a refreshing sip of water at the Fountain of Vic Victorious Finance. The banking district considered of several wide, consisted of several wide streets with large marble buildings on each side of them. At the banks, they went first to Trustworthy Bank, and then to Faithful Savings and Loan, and then to Subservient Financial Services each time inquiring about for Mr. Poe. Finally, a receptionist of Subservient said she knew what that Mr. Poe worked down the street at Mulcahy Money Management. The building was square and rather plain looking, though once inside, the three orphans were intimidated by the hustle and bustle of people as they raced around the large echoey rooms. 
Finally, they asked a uniformed guard whether they had arrived at the right place to speak to Mr. Poe, and he led them into a large office with many fine cabinets and no windows. Why, hello, said Mr. Poe in a puzzled tone of, of voice. He was sitting at a desk covered in typed papers that looked important and boring, surrounding a small framed photo of his wife and two beastly sons, who were three telephones with flashing lights. Please come in. Thank you, Claus said, shaking Mr. Poe's hand. The Baudelaire youngsters sat down on the th three large and comfortable chairs. Mr. Poe opened his mouth to speak, but he had to cough into his handkerchief before he could begin. I am very pleased today, he said finally. So I don't have to, I'm busy, I am very busy today, he said finally. So I don't have too much time to chat. Next time you should call ahead of time when you plan on being in the neighborhood, and I will put some time aside to take you to lunch. That would be very pleasant, Violet said, and we're sorry that we didn't contact you before we stopped by, but we find ourselves in an urgent situation. Count Olaf is a madman, Klaus said, getting right to the point. We cannot stay with him. He struck Kla Klaus across the face. Sees bruise, Violet said, but just as she said it, one of the telephones rang in a loud, unpleasant wail. Excuse me, Mr. Poe said, and he picked up the phone. Poe here, he said, into the receiver. What? Yes. 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 No, yes. Thank you. He swung up the phone and looked at the Baudelaire's as if he had forgotten they were there. I'm sorry, Mr. Poe. I'm sorry, Mr. Poe said. What were you talking about? Oh, yes, Count Olaf. I'm sorry you don't have a good first impression of him. He has only provided us with one bed, Klaus said, and makes us do a great many difficult chores. He drinks too much wine. Excuse me, Mr. Poe said, as another telephone rang. Poe here, he said, seven, 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 seven. Six and a half, seven. You're welcome. He hung up and quickly wrote something down on his papers, then looked at the children. I'm sorry, he said. What were you saying about Count Olaf? Make you do chores doesn't sound too bad. Thanks. This is my cat, Danny. Say hi, Danny. Okay. <laughs> Lay down. it's orphans. He has terrible friends. He is always asking about our money. Poco. This was from Sunny. Mr. Posat uh, put his hands up to indicate he had heard enough. Children, children, he said. You must give yourselves time to adjust to your home. You've only been there a few days. We've been there long enough to know Count Olaf is a bad man, Klaus said. Mr. Post sighed, and he looked at each of the three children. His face was kind, but it didn't look like he really believed what the Baudelaire orphans were saying. Are you familiar with the Latin term in loco parentis? He asked. Violet and Sunny looked at Klaus, the biggest reader of the three. He was the most likely to know the vocabulary word and foreign phrases. Something about trains, he said. Maybe Mr. Poe was going to take them on a train to another relative. Mr. Poe shook his head. In loco parentis means acting in the role of parent, he said. It is a legal term and it applies to Count Olaf. Now that you are in his care, the, the Count may raise you using his method, any method he sees fit. I'm sorry if your parents did not make you do the household chores or if you never saw them drink any wine or if you like, or if you like their friends better than Count Olaf's friends, but these are things that you must get used to as Count Olaf is acting in loco parentis, understood? But he struck my brother, Violet said. Look at his face. As Violet spoke, Mr. Poe reached into his pocket for his handkerchief and, covering his mouth, coughed many, many times into it. He coughed so loudly that Violet could not be certain that he he had heard her. Whatever Count Lo Olaf has done, Mr. Poe said, glancing down at his papers and cir circling a number, he has acted in loco parentis and there's nothing I can do about it. Your money will be protected by myself by, and by the bank. But Count Olaf's parenting techniques are his own business. Now, I hate to assure you post haste, but I have very important work to do. The children just sat there stunned. Mr. Poe looked up and cleaned his throat. Post haste, he said, means, means you'll do nothing to help us, Violet finished for him. She was shaking with anger and frustration. As one of the phones began ringing, they stood up and walked out of the room, followed by Klaus, who was carrying Sunny. They stalked out of the bank and stood on the street, not knowing what to do next. What shall we do next, Klaus said sadly. Violet stared at the sky. 
She wished that she would invent something that could take them out of there. It's getting a bit late, she said. We might as well just go back and think of something else tomorrow. Perhaps we can stop and see Justice Strauss. But he said she wouldn't help us, Klaus said. Not for help, Violet said. For books. It is very useful when one is young to learn that difference between literally and figuratively. If something happens literally, it actually happens. If something happens figuratively, it feels like it's happening. If you are literally jumping for joy, for instance, it means you are leaping in the air because you are very happy. If you are figuratively jumping for joy, it means you are so happy that you could jump for joy, but are saving your energy for other matters. The Baudelaire orphans walked back to Count Olaf's neighborhood and stopped at the home of Justice Strauss, who welcomed them inside and let them choose books from the library. Violet chose several about mechanical inventions. Klaus chose several about wolves, and Sunny found a book with many pictures of teeth inside. They then went to their room and crowded together for the only bed, uh, crowded together in the only bed, reading intently and happily. Figuratively, they escaped from Count Olaf and their miserable existence. They did not literally escape because they were still in his house and vulnerable to Olaf's evil, evil in local parentis ways. But by immersing themselves in their favorite reading topics, they felt far away from their predicament, as if they had escaped. In the situation of the orphans, figuratively escaping was not enough, of course, but at the end of their tiring and hopeless day, it would have to do. Violet, Klaus, and Sunny read their books and, in the back of their minds, hoped that soon their figurative escape would eventually turn into a literal one. All right, so that is chapter five. Um, my cat, Danny, decided to join for a little bit of the, re of the read aloud, so that was fun. Um, again, I really love this story. I think it's become really interesting. In the last part of the chapter, you could really hear the author's a voice kind of come out where he's talking about literative and figurative language. Um, this is stuff that I've talked to about with my students, so I hope you enjoyed the chapter. I'm very curious. It seems like nothing can get done about them leaving Count Olaf. I hope they come up with a different uh, solution to their problem. Uh, stay tuned for the next chapter. I'll see you soon. Bye.